Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30-year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are in a 30-year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Grilling JR, the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Jim, how are you, man? I'm good, Conrad. I'm uh, ready to rock and roll. Finish out this uh, compelling Lex Luger story. Uh, so we're going to pick it up today uh, from, uh, I think, WrestleMania 9, you told me. So it's good. Yeah, the next I, time you have seen Lex. I was actually there for that, believe it or not. So uh, <laughs> the uh, well, we got good response on the last Luger show. He's a, he's a very polarizing character. It's one way of saying, it, I think. So it should be a, a fun, uh, uh, as, as, uh, as, uh, urban Meyer would say, this is a deep dive. <laughs> and as, a, as a, one of my best friends says, there's a lot to unpack here. <laughs> Let's keep it rolling. <laughs> I am uh, pumped to keep it rolling and talk about the Lex express and all that that entailed uh, Lex Luger. I think when I was a kid, he's got to be one of my top five favorites, really he's like a real life action figure. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, don't get me wrong. Uh, I'm still a Lex Luger fan, but now I'm more a Lex Luger fan of the man, because I had the good fortune of meeting him and man, I know there's some stories about, oh, Lex was this way and Lex was that way. I cannot stress how much respect and appreciation I have for Lex Luger, the person, as we're talking here today in 2021. So I'm just pumped to talk about it, man. I think he's a fascinating individual. I think he's got one hell of a story and to, uh, to be on the other side of, of so much stuff and yeah. in such a great place is really remarkable. It is. Yeah. He said, he's another one of those guys and we did the Magnum TA show a few weeks ago and you know, Mag got a bad hand dealt him and, and then Lex is kind of the same category, you know, his health issues, uh, uh, are, are been very challenging for him. So I think he has taken on a different perspective now than a lot of fans had of him early, earlier when he was wrestling and, uh, what did, what attracted you to him His physique? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I was a big Sting fan and a big Scott Steiner and Rick Steiner fan. So back in the day in WCW, when I first started watching those guys, those four were like inseparable. So, you know, I mean, sure. They're trying to you know take on the horsemen and all that, but that's like the cluster of good guys at the time. And I, I guess you yeah. could probably throw in flying Brian in there, uh, maybe even Z man, but Flying Brian and, and the Steiner brothers and Sting and Lex Luger. When I was a kid, man, that was WCW. That was fun. Yeah. Yeah. Good group of guys. Good yeah. group of guys. I can tell you that. So, well, you know, we covered uh, Lex going in uh, when he first got started. The football, you know, is he played a lot of football, but it was kind of undistinguished. And I always, that always kind of got a burr under my saddle because anytime you play at a, at a D1 level, 
anytime you get the uh, opportunity to play professional football uh, on any scale, uh, that, there ain't nothing wrong with that. And I thought that he, uh, uh, some people married that lack of football success to him. And I don't think that's fair. So, but in any event, uh, we're now up to the part of Lex's career where he had made the big jump finally. Yep. And, uh, I know Vince always coveted Lex and largely just like I asked you the question, he, he was enamored by Lex's look, right. And how marketable his Lex's look was. And, uh, and you know, Vince is a body guy and Lex certainly had a body and a very good one. Yeah. Let's talk about it. Um, he was the, he was the narcissist when he comes in. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I guess we should sort of set the table. He, he winds up coming over just as we finished a few weeks ago, Meltzer predicted, Hey, he's going to come over be a part of the WBF. And uh, as soon as his contract allows him to, he's going to start wrestling for the world wrestling federation. And that is the way it shook out. Of course, Jr. wasn't there for that. Uh, Jr. shows up at WrestleMania nine. So that's where we can really pick up the story. But by the yeah. time you get there, Luger had already been wrestling for the WBF for a bit. And the, uh, the story had been, oh, he's got a steel plate in his forearm and he's using that as his, his finish, which I guess is pretty creative, but the narcissist gimmick, I mean, you were just talking about how Vince McMahon and even Lex Luger himself were enamored with his physique as well. He should be probably the best body and maybe in the history of wrestling. Uh, he's got these, uh, I don't know, ladies, I guess we would call him accompanying him to the ring and they're holding the, the mirror and he's posing and flexing and it's an idea. what do you think of the narcissist persona? Uh, thought we could have done better. Yeah. But didn't hate it, but I thought we could have done better. I had to, uh, get a, my dictionary and see what the hell narcissist even meant. Uh, <laughs> I really did. I didn't know. So, uh, and that's, I, I, the irony of that is uh, working in wrestling all those years, you know, I was 19 years in the business before I got to WWE. So I wasn't exactly an overnight sensation, even though those previous 19 years were not, uh, saw me, you know, damned in isolation and obscurity. Uh, but I, I didn't know what a narcissist was, even though I'd worked with plenty of them, didn't even know it. Uh, but. I, I thought we could have done better on that, on that deal, but it, it, it did get Lex some attention. I guess that's the object, get attention when he, when he debut, you know, Vince is going to take care of him real well on his win loss record. And, uh, I said this before, I don't know that I've ever, I can't recall. Now maybe somebody will pop my head later. You maybe you can remind me of somebody, uh, that that Vince tried harder to get over than Lex Luger, the promotional, uh, manifestations, the Lex express, the intrepid Yokozuna, all those things were, uh, were major elements in trying to establish Lex as somebody very, very special, but Vince really worked his ass off to, to accomplish those things. So we can't ever, I don't think we can blame McMahon. Like, like we often do in this business for everything. Uh, I don't think we can blame Vince for Lex not getting over to the level that was perceived for him to become because Vince did everything he could do. It's just, you know, somewhere along the way, you have to connect with your audience and sometimes it, it and there's no timeline for that. Some guys connect right away and some guys connect years later. So I think that's where I stood on that deal. I thought we could have done a better job of introducing him, but uh, I, I know the effort was there and that was just the first phase of, of, uh, the narcissist stuff, you know? So in any event, he's, he got, he got promoted. Well, I can tell you that he got promoted well and, and, and expensively. I get it. It's a wrestling podcast, but he's saving us money on our mortgage. You really trust this process. The reviews don't lie. Five-star review after five-star review. We make it fast. We make it easy and it's no cost or obligation. Give us a shot to earn your business. I'm telling you, you'll be glad you did, especially if you like keeping more of your own money. You don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket. So what are you waiting for? Hurry to save with Conrad.com.
do you think he felt like just based on look alone? Hey, this could be my next Hulk Hogan. Of course. Absolutely. I, I think it was Vince at one time fully believed that Lex Luger would be his next Hogan. And, uh, the issue there is, is that, you know, uh, I, I will tell you, I thought Lex was a lot better athlete than Hogan, but he didn't have Hogan's charisma. You know, whether we like Hogan or you don't like Hogan or, or, you know, he's not, he was never a great worker and all that stuff. What is a, what is a great worker, Conrad? What the right. fuck is a great worker? He, he applies the headlock correctly. He doesn't leg slap or is it somebody that draws money? Well, if it's on well, somebody that draws money, it's a one com key component. How do you say Hogan wasn't a great worker? He drew money. He pulled the wagon and he asked any of those cats on those, on the cards back in the day, or was the WWF at the time, uh, what, uh, what card do you want to be on? I want to be on Hogan's card. They get their booking sheets. What's the first thing to look for? Look for where's Hogan booked. And now am I on that card? Cause we know it's going to draw. So I think that was the issue with elections, that, that charisma thing. And that's not a sin, by the way, I'm not knocking the guy. I mean, there's a lot of guys that didn't have Hogan's charisma. Few did as a matter of fact, but I do think Vince fully believed that, that Lex had all the attributes as far as athleticism, primarily the look, uh, to, and he was, you know, could be articulate. He was a little different. He's a departure from Hulk, but I think that was the mindset. We may, we may have our next Hogan. And, uh, so that we, the, and so that journey began. I'm just fascinated by that, that Vince, who knows so much about wrestling, uh, and boy, some of our listeners just laughed, but I mean, he, he understands how to promote and how to connect with the audience and what's going to quote unquote, get over or whatever you want to call it, but to just boil it down to, well, that's your Hogan, because he looks a certain way. And candidly, I, I I'm only here talking to you about wrestling because of Hulk Hogan. I was a little Hulkamaniac and now I'm a big Hulkamaniac. I'm a big fan of his. You're just big Conrad. I am just big, but I'm just thinking <laughs> there's, there's no, I, I don't see how you could make the leap to say, well, he's got a better body than Hulk. So he'll be just as big. And I don't think that was the case. Okay. I think it was a feel the same, same, uh, maybe some of the same things that you, attracted you to Hogan. Yeah. The he, charisma you know. is what got all over me. I mean, hit the silly hand gestures and, or, you know, something, all that, that worked for me as a little kid and Luger just didn't have any of those. Right. I almost feel like Luger could be, uh, I don't know. Even comparing him to the ultimate warrior wouldn't be fair because the warrior had a fantastic body, but you know, Luger didn't have the, I'm going to run to the ring and the crazy music and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, let's keep it going. Let's talk about when there's a lot to unpack here, Conrad. Let's, let's talk about when we hit the reset <laughs> button. And that's really why we're talking Lex Luger today. Of course, yes. we had originally hoped to do Lex Luger all in one episode, but as you like to say, Jim, cause Lord knows I would never say something like that. There's so much to unpack here. Uh, There's no so way much to get it in one episode. So, uh, -huh. uh, we split it up. And the reason we decided to split it up and do it today is because of the 4th of July, which of course is right around the corner. And that's really when the Lex express is born. So the narcissist is put to rest. Uh, and here we go with the reset. Were you involved at, at, at any of the, uh, quote unquote office discussions about, uh, sort of getting a, um, a, a, a new, a new coat of paint as Bruce likes to say, uh, not, not really too much in depth. I mean, Vince would say, you know, what do you think? You know, you work with him, et cetera, et cetera. What kind of guy is he? Yeah. Things like that. Just to get background. Uh, I was, I was involved in, uh, the, t the vignettes that we did on the intrepid, uh, which was miserably hot and what a day I remember, I remember that here, you, re you remember funny things about, uh, certain days of work. I get a ride over to New York city from Stanford, you know, one of those deals say meet so-and-so here, they'll give you a ride over. Uh, here and we're here. Nelson Swagler is going to be your producer. And, uh, and uh, Nelson was there for years and years and years. And, uh, so I, I go there to the, the intrepid, I look, you know, they take me a little tour 
uh, this famous, famous battleship. And, uh, they, we lay out the, what we're going to be doing and all that stuff, start recording. And then the shoot's over and everybody's gone. And I, they forgot my ass. So I'm left in New York city with no ride. So you, you can say, well, I don't get, get Uber. I don't know that Uber is even available now. No. Uh, and the other fact is getting a, well, I get a cab. You get a cab. Yeah. Get a cab from New York city to another state. Yeah. To Connecticut, for example. So it was a, not a good day for me because <laughs> it's just so, you know, pain in the ass It's so hot on that period at that point in time. So I remember that very well. And then I, uh, I think I was, I made one or two trips to the intrepid to do these vignettes. And then, uh, I didn't go to the day of the, uh, well, maybe I don't know if I went there or not that day. I may have, I don't think so. I don't think I went to the day that it actually, we actually recorded it where all the fans were there and Lex came in and, and Yoko Zuna got slammed and all that shit. So, uh, but uh, that's about to the extent of my, my involvement, the production side, because again, this is 90, what year is this? 93 Conrad, uh, the Lex express in 93 or four. That's right. 93. So I just, I was just getting into town, you know, I, I essentially hadn't hung my clothes up yet. So right. I didn't, I wasn't too deep into the, you know, the Bruce, Pat, Vince triumphant, my only involvement, you know, going to swanky Frank's and having hot dogs at Patterson. No jokes, please. And, uh, and, and then Bruce and I lived near each other. So, uh, that was always good. And, uh, so anyway, the story of course, as everybody knows, Luger is going to come down in a helicopter wearing, uh, I think jeans and cowboy boots, but certainly that American flag shirt is going to rush past Bobby Heenan. And by the way, this is. Uh, a ring set up on the intrepid, All right? What a, what a shoot, what a shot. And I think as a rib, the, the, the damn ring canvas was so hot and Yoko back yeah. in would wrestle, uh, barefoot and the, uh, the sandals come off. He immediately steps on the canvas and, and regrets it. Wants the sandals back. Fuji knows that's hot, kicks him away. He's probably <laughs> ready to do anything he can to get this over with. Yeah. As they might, no one can slam the mighty Yokozuna. And then all of a sudden by helicopter, Lex Luger arrives, bam, gets it done. It's an interesting way to sort of set the stage for Lex Luger. And it's simple. You know, I, we didn't overthink it these days. It feels like if someone is a bad guy now they're going to be a good guy, there may be some elaborate, uh, you know, plot twist. And that's not what we see here. It's, no. Hey, this guy was obsessed with himself, but now he's got an American flag shirt and he slammed a big Japanese yeah. guy. Yeah. Nothing supersedes his patriotism. Yes. And during the 4th of July celebrations and holiday and all that good stuff, uh, very timely in that regard. Um, I, uh, yeah, even wrestling companies are sometimes now tinkering with the, uh, the occult, the macabre. People are being hypnotized. Conrad, can you hypnotize me right now? Cause I'm sleeping. No I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's changing. It just does seem, it, here's the thing about it. When you say these things, whether it be you much younger than me and, uh, celebrating your 40th birthday imminently. And I'm proud of that. Happy for you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think that, uh, when we say things like this, especially in my case, because of my age, it's, uh, it's the old, the, the, the millennials, uh, some of the don't just don't, don't agree with my philosophy of pro wrestling. It goes right back to the same old core, uh, well, it's passing by business has changed. Who the fuck made you the goddamn expert to tell me that business has changed. Hmm. How has business changed? What do you mean by business has changed? Can you fucking somebody explain that to me? Or you can tell me why leg slapping is good while taking indiscriminate bumps and selling every third one is good. Oh, well, business has changed. 
Don't you know? No, I got, I didn't get the fucking memo. House business changed in that regard. So do you bring it back to your point? Simpler is usually better, even though you and I are engulfed by this crazy ass product of pro wrestling. Everybody's not. They pick and choose what they're going to watch. They yep. pick and choose what they're going to listen to, but they're not immersed in it 24 hours a day. And oftentimes guys like you and me to our own detriment at times are immersed in pro wrestling 24 fucking seven. Yep. And so it seems, well, if you didn't like it, you don't like it. Just why are you in it? Okay. Good job. Good question. Einstein, you should be on the, you should be on a, a fucking game show. Jeopardy might be good for you. Just make sure you put it in the form of a question. Why am I a dumbass? Well, I, I discovered that wrestling has changed. Okay. What does change mean? Does it, does it change for the better or is all, is all change good? Not necessarily, but it's certainly not all change isn't all bad. So I, I get, I get the red ass on that deal a little bit about, well, this is, it's changed and, and you're old. So it's passed you by. Uh, I believe in the fundamental soundness of storytelling and people in Hollywood look for that every day. And they, they do these projects called movies or television productions. So I'm not big on that storytelling is storytelling and the fundamentals of storytelling need to be in place. Yep. So, uh, that's my, my take on that situation. What, what we did with Luger where he, he did the impossible, the baby face came out of nowhere with a spectacular entrance on a very unique stage on a very special week, all draped in red, white, and blue, uh, was, uh, extraordinary. It was great booking it was great writing or whatever you want to say casting. I don't know. So it was, uh, it was good, but it was basic and plain and was not complicated so that those fans who aren't 24 seven could, could glance through it and get the message without having to be watch a, a seven part or something. It happened in one day, boom, finish. Here we go. So I, I'm a big believer that, uh, things haven't changed that much. And certainly, and I also believe that all change is not good. And I also agree, I believe that all change isn't bad. People just run from people have uh, people adapt to change in a different, different ways. Talk to me about how you felt on the heels of this slam on the intrepid. Like you had worked with Lex, you had seen where WCW and we, this has been well-established now because we just talked about it had fumbled with him a few times. Yeah. He gets to the top spot and they cut his water off as Arn likes to say, Yeah, it happened over, over and over, over. Oh, I mean, it's just, it was silly by the time it finally happened. It didn't mean as much. No. It felt like the time had missed him. Time had gone by and they missed their opportunity. Did this feel like, Hey, this is it. They're going to do it for real this time. Or, or were you concerned? Shit, man, this just ain't going to work. It never has. Well, I, no, I didn't think that. Uh, I, the, the never has part. I, I will concur with you. I thought that in Vince's machine with all the people surrounding, uh, Vince involved in creative and execution and television production and all these things that if anybody could pull this off, it's Vince and company. So I was very open-minded that that was going to occur because again, uh, you go back to look at the, this, what you're, what you have here. Look at the eight by 10. Yeah. Look at the clip. Look at whatever you want to look at. He's pristine. He's tall. Uh, we don't talk about tallness enough, but he was six, four, uh, or something that thereabouts. He may have been a little taller, six, five, six, three. I don't know. The great body. As we know, we've talked about that ad nauseum. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you, you can't, it's hard to discount that. It's hard to say, well, I know it's, it's a crucial in almost every walk of promotional life, but not this time. Bullshit. It's always, just, it's all the same. Luger turned heads and until somebody had gone and tried everything they could. He was going to be a, uh, somebody that's always going to get extra treatment. 
because of how he looked. He had the look that every promoter coveted, all of them, all of them. And so, and knowing Vince and how he liked size and bodies and so forth, again, I thought, well, if anybody can do it, McMahon can. Well, they're going to take a stab at it. The Lex express is the idea. It's going to crisscross the country, but he doesn't wrestle, uh, his first wrestling match after body slamming Yokozuna. It's for the USWA in Memphis at the mid South Coliseum. And he's going to defeat Yoko in a non-title match. Talk, listen, I understand that Vince has that famous clip out there that says we make movies. I get that. But if we're going to crisscross the country and try to get this guy over, should we not have him, you know, win some fucking matches? What do you think of that creative? It's a, it, well, it was just a different philosophy, Conrad. It's just marketing. Uh, you know, it was the old barnstorming tour. You know, Jack Dempsey did barnstorming tours and boxing way back in the day, but he didn't fight in every town. Right. It's all publicity. And, uh, and the, it was expensive. He had to have a driver and an attendant, you know, guys like him have to eat every three hours. So seriously, somewhere thereabouts, and they got to eat certain things. It's like, not like you and me on the, on the, uh, Conrad express. We're going to stop where whatever's fucking open. We don't care. Yeah. Uh, you got any burgers, you got any pizza, you got any barbecue, <laughs> whatever's there. We're going to eat it. He wasn't that way. You know, he, he had to have his, his grilled chicken breasts and, and all those things and balance his carbs. I'll say that he's very dedicated how he, how he, how he ate, but I, I can see why I, I think that's why we, we, he didn't wrestle as much. The other thing was, you know, we knew that that was the, the marriage is going to be Yoko and Lex, uh, obviously Yoko being the champion, uh, it was thought that Lex would be the next champion. But Vince wanted to make sure that Lex had all of his eyes dotted, T's crossed, as related to working with Yoko. So that's why they went off Broadway down in Memphis and had a had a run through to see how that was going to be, because everybody's got to kind of figure out their next their dance partner and your new music and all that good stuff. So it, that was all done to protect Lex. Because we knew what we had in Yoko, obviously. So I think that's the that was the basic reason. Just publicity garnering publicity and then they shoot all this video footage in these towns salt the crowd a little bit so there's a crowd there it's like a like a the old i always compare it to the old politicians on the train you know it's just uh, you had to have a crowd there and then that crowd made the news well, those newsreel things back in the day so now you got your camera crews with you they're 24 7 and they can f feed back this footage to stanford for the, for the vignettes and all the stuff in the, you know, in, in our TV shows. So he was on television a lot, but in a controlled way to help create his image and the image that Vince wanted him to have. Tell me about the Lex express as a concept. I mean, this is the first time I remember something like this being done in wrestling. what do you think of, Hey, we're going to put Lex Luger on a bus and you knew Lex Luger, the, the real guy behind the character. Uh, what do you think he thought of the Lex express concept? Well, uh, I know he thought he wanted to get over. Yeah, for sure. And I know that he wanted to get to the next level where the big money was waiting. Uh, but I don't know how, uh, how, how motivated he was to live on that bus for a while, you know, uh, some guys could make it just fine. Some guys would feel like they're being you know, strangled, uh, squeeze, squeeze a little bit. He never told me that exactly, but I know that when I would see him at an arena, uh, he would say something along the lines. It's just good to get off the bus for a while. Cause I can see it being challenging. Oh, for sure. So, uh, like a, he was, it was like a tour bus, kind of what it was, the Lex express. He had, you know, had all the amenities TV bed. I don't know if the bed fit him because he was so damn big, but nonetheless, I think that he was happy when he got off the bus from time to time and stretch his legs, and fresh air and all that good stuff. 
So I think it started off just fine, but the, it's one of those deals where if I can endure this schedule and, and, and coexist living on the bus, it, I might just get over finally. I think that's what Lex is counting on just to get over because he had Vince's eye. He had Vince's support and, and he had, and Vince had again, that Hulk Hogan image of, you know, big muscular guy. Yeah. All that's good stuff. So, uh, but I, I'm sure it's challenging as hell. It would be for me. I can tell you that. what do you think of the, I'll be your hero music video? Do you remember that? Vaguely. I want to play it for you. Cause I know that you're really excited about it. I am. I can tell. I'm glad I'm wearing darks. This is, I'll be your hero. It's a music video that they would put was that, out. Was that an original song by Jim Johnson? I believe so. Beside me. See the American flag waving. And then sounds the like Lee Greenwood. Holding my hand every step of the way. I see that went right over your head. Oh, I'm 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 big Lee Greenwood fan. We grew up uh these eyes, you could hearing that in school. Wrong. And I'm proud to be in an American. Oh yeah, that's it. Well, again. There weren't, uh, McMahon wasn't sparing any expense or any resources. You write a song about the guy, you get him his own bus, his own tour bus, uh, in a kind of a celebratory, uh, presentation. Again, I, I mentioned earlier, Vince didn't Vince. I don't believe I can't recall anyway, ever doing more for a talent to hopefully get them over than he did for Lex in that era. It was extraordinary. That was the focal point of the company. Was Lex Luger, the I have media, a, the posters, the merch, all that stuff. I'm, I'm fascinated by <clears throat> Vince in this dynamic. It almost feels like Vince sort of sees himself as Lex Luger. I know that sounds crazy, but follow me down the rabbit hole. Uh, I believe that Vince fashions himself as a super Patriot. Would that be fair to say? Oh yeah. So in my head, Hey, I'm your hero. I'm a man of the people. I'm all about America. I've got this great physique. I can defeat these other guys from these other countries. And, but he's even forcing the word hero here in the song where he's trying to reiterate, Hey, this is our top guy. This is our baby face. He is our protector. He is our superhero, if you will. And I don't know. I think a lot of, there's a famous story out there that when DiBiase comes up to the WWF for the very first time. When uh, he meets with Pat and Vince, when Vince leaves the room, of course, DiBiase says to Pat, what do you think? Cause he's sort of explaining this gimmick, but he won't tell him what it is. And he says, I'll tell you this. If Vince were a wrestler, this would be his gimmick. And he's talking about the million dollar man. Yeah. And I feel like eventually if Vince were a wrestler, he would want to be this patriotic version of Lex Luger. He would want all, a body yeah, like all, that. So, yeah. You, does that make sense? Yeah. All jacked up looking great. Yeah. Turning heads. Yes. Making people look in the airport, all those things. So yeah, I can see that quite frankly. Uh, so, but yeah, you know, Lexus, Lexus in a good spot there. Uh, you know, I, again, it's, it's not, I don't want to, we always, in these shows like this, like our podcast podcast in general, we, we look for the negative sometimes. Uh, I don't know whose fault it was other than you almost got to go right back to the talent because could, could the company have done anything more Conrad, uh, to get Lex over than some of the things that they were doing that were very unique in that generation for promotion and, and, uh, marketing, uh, and we wouldn't be having a conversation like this probably if it had worked, if it had worked, it'd been one of the most brilliant rollouts of any pro wrestler ever. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, it, it just, it, it, but it didn't work. And I just think that, you know, some guys are blessed with a, you know, they used to say about Johnny Valentine, Johnny, it took Johnny Valentine, one of the greatest workers of all time, the father of Greg, the hammer, all that good stuff. It took him longer to quote unquote, get over than most guys coming into a territory. And some would say maybe even a year. Uh, of his style was deliberate and physical 
uh, somewhat snug to say the least. It took him a while to, to quote unquote, get over. But once he got over, he was, he was evergreen. He was over and it would extend his stay in a territory. And that's what guys were looking for because they wanted to be able to keep their kids in school, same school for a little bit more than the normal. Uh, they wanted to hear a lesson. They were wise. There's significant others regarding packing up and traveling because the rest of did, did a little of that. They went onto the territory and got started working, which is generally the wise to take care of the schooling, the packing, the moving, etc. So, uh, the boys had it easy. They're, they're working their gimmick too, with their own families more often than not sad to say. So, uh, but if this thing had worked, Conrad, we would be talking about Lex Luger was a part of one of the greatest promotional, uh, tactics in the history of pro wrestling. Yeah. The bottom line is at the end of the day, as we all know, not spoiling the ending of the story here, it didn't get over to the level that Vince had hoped it would. It wasn't, he's going to be our, he's going to be the next Hogan level. It never approached that really. So who do you blame? Right. Promotion or this, the fact that talent didn't connect. And I believe it's the latter and that's not a knock on Lex. I I'm a, like you, I've admired Lex is where he is in his life right now. And he's, he's changed his demeanor and his philosophies. And he's found the, found the Lord and he's comfortable and he's happy and that's really all that matters if you're happy yeah and he's and he seems to be happy living in a life that a lot of us would not have a hard time being happy in so uh i don't know man i i'm a, I, I think that uh i think that uh at the end of the day the rush to to get lex over some talents react well and are responded to well when they, when they got the heavy push, yes, There's that fucking word again. Uh, but let's be honest about it. At the end of the day, it's gotta be the talent that connects to the audience. Mm -hmm. And, and Lex had that, had an issue there. And I think we force fed him a little too much to where you start getting that backlash. Think about how, uh, the, the perfect baby face push was for, for the rock, Rocky Maivia and the people shit all over it too much. Let me up. And I think that's kind of where we were. Lex was, was in a, let me up situation, but you know, everybody was going to full speed ahead and here we go and damn the torpedoes. So I thought it was some that might've been part of the situation too, too much too soon. Well, let's get to, uh, how we get going. Meltzer would, uh, We're going to talk about SummerSlam. That's the big payoff, right? So we start with the 4th of July. We're marching towards SummerSlam. We've got the Lex Express. We're hoping that our hero Lex Luger can conquer the evil Yokozuna. Yep. And it's supposed to be a big celebration. It does feel like with this kind of a big push, uh, you know, the, the cross promotional tour all over the country, a music video, et cetera, et cetera. Two months of this feels like. Oh, well, he's the, he's the top guy. He's the Hulk Hogan. He's going to win the big belt and he's got a world title shot at SummerSlam. So here we are. And Meltzer would say a guy called Lex Luger who lost so much weight. He looked like he was really staying lame showed up. Seriously. Luger looked right about two thirty, which is about a 65 pound drop in the past year and 30 pounds down in only the last few weeks. Yokozuna dominated most of the match and got one near fall after another. Finally, Yoko missed the bonsai drop. Luger hit a body slam, punched Mr. Fuji, removed his protective elbow pad and hit Yoko with a clothesline, sending him to the floor for the count out finish, enabling him to keep the title in 1758. Balloons were let loose and the Steiners and Tataka hit the ring. A great video played with Luger largely from his bus trip. And after the video was over, Yoko was still knocked out. And Jim Cornette was trying to revive him. They attempted too strongly to not emphasize the idea that Luger hadn't won the title, although it was touched on in passing at the end of the broadcast, two and three quarter stars. <sighs> in hindsight, it feels like WCW all over again. Does it not? Here we are. We've got a chance to make him. And then we just don't. Yeah. I don't understand why, uh, 
the belt didn't change hands. You built to it. Yeah. People are expecting something along those lines, not a count out finish. Right. I, I, uh, was not on the, on the TV crew that night. I was with monsoon up in the nosebleeds doing radio. So I, I monsoon and I did that show for radio and, uh, he was gorilla was kind of, he, neither one of us knew the finishes. Uh, again, as I said, many times I work better when I don't know, I don't think gorillas gave a shit. Right. Uh, he felt that Lex is not going to get over. And, uh, and then when he saw the finish, which was news to both of us, it kind of confirmed what he said. You know, he can't get over being booked like this. Yeah. You, you built it all up. You set the table nice and neat, pretty place settings, all the silverware match plates, all this stuff. Beautiful. And then he pulled the, the, uh, the, 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 the what do you call those little, uh, when he put a, a cloth down on the table, the old, the old Martin magic trick where you take the cloth and you jerk it and it, and it leaves all the plates and saucers on the table. Uh, whatever, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, maybe you do. Maybe you don't. Maybe I'm saying, but, uh, we, so we set the table and then we screwed it all up. We will never know. Maybe that's exactly what it took for Lex to quote unquote, get over, become the champion and beat the immovable object, but we'll never know. Well, the stipulation going in is that Luger signed a contract that he only gets one shot at Yokozuna. So this is it. He won the match, big celebration. Cause he won, but he didn't win the title. Right. And, um, I guess the idea is he's going to win the opportunity to have a rematch by winning the Royal rumble. And this is a famous story that I guess we'll just jump into right now that a lot of people believed Luger told some random stranger at a bar or restaurant who happened to be someone who worked in the media. Oh yeah. I'm winning the world title at WrestleMania. And of course it didn't happen. Brett won the world title at WrestleMania. And there's even footage out there of at a random superstars taping where Vince introduced Lex as a hypothetical. Hey, I could see it like this one day. That's the way he introduced it to the crowd, but it was filmed. So there's Luger with the, the winged Eagle world title, the, 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 the big belt at the time. I don't buy any of this Luger told the guy in a restaurant, Malarkey. <laughs> but you heard that story before. I'm sure. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. I heard the story, but I'm like you, it was, uh, hard to believe. Yeah. And like you, Conrad, I don't believe it happened. I do just you don't think, know. Do you think there, I mean, I know you weren't <laughs> necessarily there or paying attention and really who gave a shit, you know, Vince wants to just do a hypothetical, whatever, but that video of Luger with the world title. Do you think, I mean, obviously Vince was trying to get him there, but he never pulled the trigger. Do you think he just got cold feet? Why don't you think Vince ever went all the way with him? What do you I think? think that, well, I think there was just something Conrad there that Vince had not sold himself on. There was just something missing. Uh, that was an intangible. It's hard. It didn't have an odor. It didn't have a feel. There's something, a gut feeling that we're really trying hard to this guy, but we're not, we don't seem to be making a lot of headway. And, uh, a lot of the guys, when they would confide with Vince, uh, in private express the fact that he may not be the guy. He's not a great worker. I don't know. If he's the guy that can make everybody that he's booked with look good. He's used to Ric Flair. He's used to other guys that made him look good. And it takes a different step, a different philosophy to be the other guy. And the other guy was Bret Hart who could make anybody look good. And it paid his dues and certainly had more than once and, and several times over, I would suggest. So, uh, I think when it came down to a debate, look, we all knew that Yoko was going to, could not be a long-term champion. He was morbidly obese. 
his health was going to become an issue. That's why uh, uh, under my watch, we sent him to the Duke, uh, uh, Duke university to a uh, weight loss. Uh, and it, you know, cause we, it was, a, it's just a matter of time before he's going to start flunking physicals. And then, then when the States, then the wrestling was governed by athletic commissions. If you had a Las Vegas uh, or a Nevada commission or a New York commission, for example, that, uh, wouldn't license him, then the other States are going to honor it. So all of a sudden we got a, a, this attraction that we can't use because he can't pass a physical. So we knew those days were coming. So all of a sudden we're looking for somebody to take that title spot and, you know, Brett's an iron man, Brett's Lou fucking Gary. I mean, he, 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 he didn't hurt anybody. He, he didn't get, if he got hurt, he worked through it. So, uh, there was a little political things going on back there too, that, you know, Alex was, Alex was Vince's choice for the presidency. But he didn't have the, he didn't have seemingly the overwhelming support of a lot of other significant people in the locker room, including Patterson. Patterson was a Bret Hart guy. And, and I, I've always admired his, uh, Pat's judgment and his gut feelings on things. And when you stop and think about it, yeah, Bret Hart's your answer. That's the guy. So he didn't have a bus. He had a rental car. And, and he did okay with it. So I don't know. I, I just think that everybody kept thinking Lex is going to step up and step up, but Lex, I, I, they may have also thought, well, he believes he's already been anointed. So therefore he doesn't have to work hard to become better. Hmm. He's not as good right now as he needs to be for this role. And I think that kind of that feeling in general permeated the locker room. Well, let's talk about where we are here. Um, somehow he gets himself involved with Ludwig Borga. what do you think of that creative? We're going from working with the mighty Yokozuna to Borga. Well, you know, Borga, Borga and Luger had a lot in common. Mm. Uh, they look great on eight by 10. Okay. And, uh, Borga was a foreigner. You know, he was cold as ice and willing to sacrifice. Oh gosh. Oh yeah. I know. Oh gosh. Don't let him start singing Conrad. Oh, Bruce does it every week. And I'm like, I don't know what we did to deserve this, but. <laughs> well, uh, does Jared sing every week? No, he's a terrible singer. Well, Bruce is too, but Bruce has no shame. As you know, no, no. Jeff has a little. Yeah. Well, compared to Brucey, you know, I got you. Anyway, they, they wind up working a program together. <laughs> you and I haven't ever spent much time talking about Borgo. Did you spend any time with him? Not much. Session. I found out he, he had his, uh, that secret service horse r Nazi shit on his tattooed on his body. I was going to ask if you knew about that. And, and there well, you I did. did. I saw it. And then when I talked to Vince, this week, what the fuck are we doing? So we, we got some Jewish business partners and I'm sure some Jewish talents, office people that if they see this or find out about this, we got, we're, we're defenseless. It's not like it was drawn on there with a big pen. It's a tattoo. It's permanent. And uh, that led to him, uh, leaving our employee. Oh. Yeah. Well, he, plus we, this reached. It gave us another reason of the fact that he couldn't work. Right. He wasn't a very good worker, but he looked great. Conrad, he looked great. So what you have, you have that one big piece of the puzzle and it's like a big pie. And so on one half of the pie is look and charisma, animal magnetism, all those, those type things. And then the other side is in ring ability. And we've discovered that Borga pretty tough guy didn't have any, uh, he didn't have the, he didn't have the chops, but boy, he looked like he did great. You know, the background and his accent was good. And, and, and he looked, I don't, I, I don't know how to, I don't want to be crass, but I mean, he looked like a Nazi or that I would perceive what an Oklahoma boy would perceive a Nazi to look like. Right. 
So it's like casting in a movie. So, uh, yeah, I, but that was the deal there. Borga foreigner, big, powerful guy, uh, and Luger American standing up for what's red, white, and blue, big, powerful guy. And their matches were, were, uh, were not good. Lex has never, the Lex in Lex never found his Ric Flair in WWE. And Rick helped Lex immensely by leading the matches and, and, and making Lex look great and, and helping him with psychology. But I don't think that Lex ever truly found that on a regular basis in WWE while he was there. You know, we've, we've sort of not talked about it and I feel like now's just as good a time of any, cause you kept saying that Tony looked good. Uh, Ludwig Borga looked good. We, we even read in the notes here from the observer that Luger was down 65 pounds over the last year, 30 in just the more recent weeks. What we're not talking about is the steroid trial in 1992, uh, McMahon believed he was going to be indicted. So he closes down the WBF, which was a failed venture. But around that same time is when we start to see problems with Davy boy Smith and the ultimate warrior who had been as big as a house. And now the edict is down. Hey guys, we can't do that anymore. So come 1993, when we're trying this whole, I'll be your hero, Lex express stuff. I don't think we're talking out of school to say that Lex Luger was on steroids, but if he's going to be the top guy and this lawsuit, when you're in the fight of your life is looming in the background. You probably got to get your house in order a little bit and Lex becomes the incredible shrinking man. Do you think the lack of commitment to seeing this thing through and putting the belt on him was also a concern of, well, if we put the belt on a, on a, on a guy who looks like that, it doesn't exactly help my case, right? The United <laughs> States government. Does that have more to do with not going with Lex than maybe we give it credit for? I'm not sure. It's a good, it's a good, it's a good theory and has some validity. No doubt about that. Uh, so I would say, yes, it probably has had a lot more to do, uh, to play. It had a lot more to do about it and, and to play into it than, than we've discussed. Uh, a lot of those guys too, you see them, the steroid guys, you know, uh, a warrior kind of guy who their mindset is so tied to their look that when they see themselves, you know, one of the, I used to see Lex at TV and, uh, and I would even in both companies and he knew I was bullshitting him, but if for a second there, he would, he would really have been relaxed a little bit and, and, and fell from my line of bullshit. But I see him all the time and I say, uh, Hey man, if, if, are you feeling all right? Yeah. What do you mean? I said, Oh, nothing. Oh, really? What do you mean? Well, it look like you might have the flu or something. You look like you lost a lot of weight. Then not walk off <laughs> and that would bother him. Of course they were so dependent on their look because they knew that they weren't that great bell to bell. They weren't great enough bell to bell, uh, to, you know, uh, they weren't great enough bell to bell to just let that, that work be the foundation of your, of your career, because now you go, they're looking at, they're looking at their, their physique is so much a part of their presentation. And a lot of guys, they, when they had to come off the stall, the sauce, they lost a lot of confidence. They, they, they thought they lost their ACE in the hole. Well, I might not be the greatest worker. I might not be a funk or a Briscoe. Uh, or some of that stuff or flair, Sean Michaels, but in that era, but at least I look good. So when they go off the sauce, they didn't, they didn't, they still look good. Conrad, you and I would take Lex Luger's physique 30 <laughs> pounds uh, off right now. Yeah. If I had his physique, I would not even, I'd do this show shirtless. Yeah. Pants do this shit all the time. You, yeah. You just be down at the pool all day flexing. <laughs> yeah. <One of> these. <coughs> That's silly. So I think there that the steroids has a, as a multiple 
can have multiple facets to your, to your, uh, psyche. Uh, I know a lot of guys that want to rationalize and say, well, I, I do the steroids or I've done the steroids for recovery. And I'll say, okay, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go out on a limb here and, and give you that, but let's be realistic. You're doing steroids because of how it makes you look, not how it helps you recover. And I think that that's kind of what Vince saw with Lex, you know, he's, he was the same head turner at smaller size downsized Lex Luger was not as impressive walking through the airport as a bigger Lex Luger. If that makes any sense. Yeah. So I think that's kind of where that, that that's where that story kind of comes together as far as steroids are concerned. Personally, I'm not against steroids. If you want to, if you're under doctor's care and you're getting all your blood work done and you're adhering to the medical practices uh, that this, you're being managed by, by a doctor have at it. But it, uh, other than that, uh, you know, if you're medic self-medicating on anything that's wrong. And if you're using the steroids as if I just got on the gas, I could get over total bullshit. Well, if I get on the gas, I'll get over total bullshit. I've always believed that, but at the same time, it sounds like a, a, a you know, American politician. Uh, I do believe that, uh, if they're properly managed and under doctor's care, it's not the end of the earth. Well, it is the end of the earth or so it feels like for Luger oh. here when he's, uh, quickly going to move to the back seat. Yoko and Taker are sort of married here and Luger's going to be fighting the, uh, un-Americans and the Taker Yoko program gets real hot. And now there's a bunch of cheers for Bret Hart. It feels like Bret is firmly in the uh, catbird seat to be the next big star. It's not going to be Lex Luger as the next Hulk Hogan. When do you remember that sort of settling in on not just Vince, but the rest of the office, because it does feel like we're looking for our next Hogan. All right. And, and we're not sure that Lex can be the guy, but we're giving it the old, <clears throat> the old college try, but then Brett sort of reemerges as no, it's, it's still Brett. It's going to be Brett. And it was a stop and start for Brett. They had tried this before and Yoko beat him. And Hogan came back and we've covered all that with WrestleMania nine, but now it feels like, okay, we've come to our senses. It really is Brett. Do you remember there being a moment time when that happened? One moment? No, I know it would have been after SummerSlam. Probably it was before SummerSlam because if the commitment had been made Conrad to go with the, uh, Lex, it would have been. That would have, that we would, we, that would have been a decision would have been made prior to SummerSlam, whether you're going to have the match for the title yeah. between Yoko and Lex. So I'm saying that sometime that summer after the intrepid and before August, uh, the jury came back with a, a guilty verdict. We're not going to, we're not going to go there. And again, uh, and I, and I applaud Pat Patterson, uh, you know, the Pat was such a devotee of Brett's and a lot of us were a lot of guys are kind of older school believed in Brett's working ability. The fact that he was, he didn't hurt people. As I said earlier, the fact that he was du durable, uh, fundamentally sound and, and he was not a spot oriented guy. He was a wrestler and that's why he got over and we still talk about him. Not because he could do a hurricane Rana, uh, or, and slap his ass on the headbutt. Right. It was just the fact that Brett was that good. And I think it's just unfortunate that he was never given until later on the credit that he deserved for being arguably the best in the world. There was a time there where, you know, well, it's always Rick. It's always Sean. It's always this guy. Hey, what about this Bret Hart guy? I wouldn't want to leave him out of any discussion. Who's one of the best workers ever. That's, that would make it no sense to me. So I think that somewhere along that summer it was discovered or realized whatever that, uh, Lex is not going to be the answer, unfortunately. And, uh, but you know, Vince, Vince, not the kind of guys that say, well, I, 
we spent all this money on it, Conrad. We've got to continue on to steer the course. McMahon is big about cutting his losses. And when he's off something, he's off something. I can tell you from experience. So, uh, and he doesn't need a specific reason. It's just a gut feeling. And he would always say to you, oh, he's told me this many times. My track record's pretty good, JR. My track record's pretty good. And, and, and it is. Because look where you are in the market share globally. It's not just like you run your little Northeast territory. Right. You're the, the, the world is your territory now. So I think you've done pretty well with your, with your track record. Well, the Royal rumble, it's uh well remembered for the double finish. You know, you've got Luger and Brett touching at the same time. Uh, it's gotta be uh, a little nerve wracking from a production standpoint, but they pull it off. what do you think of the finish? Two guys touching the floor at the same time. This is the first time that has happened in the rumble. That was a Patterson finish. And, uh, you know, you can, you can make an argument that may have been the, uh, argument that Patterson gave Vince who may have said, well, let's give let's give Luger one more try. That could have happened. And Pat said, Vince, you know, it's not going to work. We've done everything we can for him. Uh, and but Brett's our guy and they come up with a finish that where Brett and Lex both get spotlight. I, I didn't, I liked the finish quite frankly, because it was different. We've always said here on the show, wrestling fans love things that are new and unique, innovative. And I look at that finish as just that very innovative. And it kept the story alive to where you left the air with more questions than answers. And I always think that's a good formula. I love the idea. And, uh, ultimately it does feel like, Hey, this could be Luger's chance. And of course at WrestleMania 10, as we discussed, he comes up short again, it's Brett's night and, uh, he's not going to be the world champion here or anytime in the WWF. Uh, after WrestleMania 10, he's off to feud with Mr. Perfect again, but it starts to feel like he's floundering a little bit. He's floating through the mid card with the likes of crush and Tatanka, not to disparage those guys, just saying it felt like once upon a time, he was going to be the world champ after WrestleMania 10. Is it fair to say that, uh, Luger's character is just sort of going through the motions here in the WWF, uh, well, for the lack of a better expression, probably going through the motions also signifies to me that somebody's not putting out any effort. They're not doing anything extra to get over. I'm not so sure that it was that extreme, but for simplicity's sake, he Lex could read the handwriting on the wall. I see his goal to be the champion was uh, shit on in Chicago at SummerSlam. You tell this beautiful story, you get there and you, uh, it, it, nothing, there was no climax. It made a, you know, I'm not gonna go into detail on that analogy, but nonetheless, uh, it's just, there was no payoff and the fans felt let down. And then they felt that, well, he's not our guy. And then you get to, then they set, try to salvage all that again. Revisit it again at the Royal rumble, rethink it again. And again, uh, we said earlier, you know, the, the idea would have been, we wouldn't, we don't know how it would have worked out, but it certainly would have been interesting to see how it would have worked out. If Lex had beat Yoko Zuna at, uh, at SummerSlam and you could have done it just as easily as said, this match has no disqualifications. You can lose by, you can lose by disqualification. You can lose because you had Cornette out there and Fuji and all that other cast of thousands, uh, count outs count the same as a pinfall. We've seen those matches. We've had, we've seen those matches. So Yoko could have done the same thing. Took a big old bump. Didn't make it back in the ring and Luger wins the title by count out. That could have happened. Would have been ideal. Not really, but if you're just hell bent on not beating Yoko. And that may have been some of the influence of the undertaker as well, Conrad, because undertaker loved work with Yokozuna. They drew money. They had a great relationship in and out of the ring and they sold tickets. So, you know, it was a matter of, well, we can't beat Yoko. It's good. It goes back to where 
when wrestlers are really active wrestlers are really involved in the creative, sometimes it's not totally objective. Uh, they're looking out for their own, their own, you know, who's going to better, better my bread, so to speak. So there's a lot of backstage stuff that goes on and things like that. But I, I believe that I think Vince had heard enough from Patterson and maybe even Bruce, I don't know that it was time to move on from this project. It's just not going to work, Vince. And, you know, he hates to give up on shit. That's why I think probably he rethought. And then he said, well, let's, let's try this at the rumble. Come up with something, Pat. You created, you know, you, it's, you, you created the match. Give me a finish. And the finish that came up with was that, uh, <coughs> both guys hitting the hitting at the, the floor at the same time, which as you pointed out, is very challenging to pull off. But, uh, that was in Tampa. I remember that show. I didn't do, I didn't do the, I don't think I did the play by play on that show, but I thought the finish was pretty captivating. The, uh, the next creative for Lex is going to be teaming with Davy boy Smith as a tag team called the allied powers. I kind of liked this tag team. Uh, I was a big British bulldog fan as a kid. Obviously we've established I was a Luger fan. So putting them together, I thought was a pretty decent little idea. Yeah, I uh, did too. They're even going to wind up defeating, uh, the blue brothers who we know as Ron and Don Harris at WrestleMania 11, but they don't really work any programs until they feud with Owen and Yokozuna later that year. What was Lex's attitude during all this? Was he in good spirits? Is he happy with his, his lot in life or is he regretting his decision to jump to the WWF? Do you think? I think he was, uh, maybe relieved that the incessant push to get him into that title picture. And then eventually when the championship was over, I think he might've been a little bit relieved. Uh, and he also had tag partners and tag opponents that could uh, enhance him and help him, uh, continue to get better. I mean, anytime you get in the ring with Owen Hart and Yoko Zuna, it's a pretty damn good day because they were great, really great. And then, uh, and, and Davey had, to, had, had established success in, in a tag team. I don't know how good an influence Davey and Lex were to each other. I have no idea. Uh, but I, I'm like you, I, the, the tag team looked good in publicity pictures. They, they had their, you know, their, 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 their ring attire and all that good stuff. They look like a ph phenomenal team. They look both big time players, but I think Lex is probably a little bit relieved that he had somebody to, to, to help him through this matches and, and get better. At least I, I would want to thank you. wanting to get better. You can't live off physique alone. You can't. And I think for years and years, that's where he was put in that. He was always put in that position. Finishes programs were affected. And if he hadn't looked so wonderful and overpowering. Uh, he would have been the, the creative process would have slowed down so he could, his skill set could catch up with his push. And that was always the biggest issue to me that helped that hurt him was that his look superseded his skill level. Talk to me about, um, SummerSlam 95. Where were you with the company at that time? I know that you had some stops and starts along the way, but I don't know the exact timeline off the top of my head. What were you yeah. doing with the company off SummerSlam 95? Do you recall? Or was that that's in Pittsburgh? It's the one with uh diesel and King Mabel on top, Sean and razor. Yeah. And Slider Man. Well, I was, I think I was still, I, I was only, I was active, uh, basically a backup announcer. You know, I was basically taking monsoon's place because gorilla's health is starting to fail. Uh, and he was not feeling well and, uh, which was so sad, but I was still, I was around. I just wasn't, I wasn't being used like all of us want to be used more, better, more creatively, bigger role, more responsibility, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't come there. As I said, uh, I was talking about the Terry Funk thing. I didn't come there to, to just stand on the sideline with a visor and a clipboard, right? Like an NFL backup quarterback. I came to play and I was a starting quarterback, so to speak, when uh, I was in, uh, WCW. So, uh, 
I, I don't know. I, I was, I was employed making money, but I wasn't happy and I didn't, and I didn't, and that didn't play well for a lot with a lot of people. And I, and I had, to, if I had to do all over again, I would just shut the fuck up, been quiet, uh, uh cash my, you know, b- bank my checks and been happy. I had a job, but I was so damn hungry that I thought I needed to, had, I had to do more to keep it, to be happy. And, uh, that was an error in judgment on, on my part, quite frankly. Well, the, uh. SummerSlam show is one of the last times we'll see Lex Luger. He's not booked, uh, on the actual card, but he is going to be uh, around for the main event on the baby face side of things. Uh, but very quickly, we have a problem with Lex Luger. He's going to wind up jumping to nitro. You're not involved in talent relations at the time. This is on JJ's watch, right? Yeah. And. I'm curious from your perspective, somebody who has been up and down the road with Lex for a long time, dating back to the Crockett days and whatnot was, was Luger sharing any of his frustration or unhappiness or anything like that with you? Or was he playing no. anything really close to the vest? Very close to the vest. Uh, that was one of the issues that one could perhaps point to that, uh, that led to the locker room becoming strong Bret Hart supporters. Lex, I've always thought Lex had a good heart. Uh, and we're seeing that today, but he also was very introverted and very insecure. So therefore he being so introverted and he, and he can laugh, I guess, well, how can a pro wrestler be successful and be introverted? Very good question. It can happen. As long as when the light comes on the camera, that red light comes on that they can, they can perform. Uh, but he was very quiet. So I didn't get any, I didn't get any Intel from him on, on those things, uh, whatsoever, but you could, you didn't take a detective to figure out that he was not happy. He was even more quiet than he normally was. And he seemed to be disconnected emotionally from the brand. And, you know, his dream of being the WWF champion was never going to happen. He realized it. everybody else around him realized it. And so that great big push he had with the buses and the trip and the helicopters, all that shit was, was just a, a memory. And it was a, it was a wasted, it wasn't wasted, but it was a experiment that didn't come, come to fruition. He had a hard time with that as, as, and some of the boys, you know, misery loves company, you know? So if somebody saw somebody else uncomfortable or not happy, then all of a sudden private conversations would be held that would lead to bringing that topic up and adding salt to the wounds. It's sad to say, but that's kind of how the business works sometimes. So when you find out. Or how do you find out? Are you watching nitro when he shows up? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember if it was leaked or something. I can't, I don't recall exactly the details, but I think I don't even know I was watching nitro at that time. Now you know, I think a little bit more about it, but I know that I got phone calls, and things of that nature. Did you see nitro? Do you see Luger? Whatever. And, uh, and again, you know, he makes this great first impression. He looks great, but, uh, you know, I, I wasn't aware of his contractual issues, good, bad, or indifferent that, you know, like I said, you said earlier, JJ was in charge of that. And I'm not blaming JJ. I'm sure JJ wanted to, to do his, to take care of business, uh, and, and get the contract handled, but it just didn't, it didn't happen. Uh, and I, I know I could guarantee you Vince, Vince Patterson, uh, had Bruce probably, and I'm not pointing fingers at those guys. Uh, they, they had to be aware that, uh, this contract was up and he was, at, he was, he was out of contract. Right. And that's, you know, I had the same experience I had with Jeff, uh, you know, just bad timing and. And at the end of the day, it seemed like it was maybe meant to be hell. I don't know, but, uh, 
some people know it just didn't, it just doesn't pop its head up. So, oh my God, I didn't realize this. They realized it. They knew, and maybe they didn't care, but I think the last thing they thought was that he'd just walk out and then walk in to the, uh, mall of America in Minneapolis and, and uh, be, re be reintroduced as a WCW talent. I'm, uh, I'm curious to hear you've told me, or you've told the world a little bit about the whole Jeff Jarrett situation before with, with his contract expiring, but let's talk about here with Lex when that happens, uh, let me hit the reset button on the conversation. Sometimes when an injury happens in sports, that injury represents opportunity to other guys on the team. Right. If the starter starting quarterback goes down, now there's an opportunity for the backup quarterback to really finally showcase what he can do. It, right. it created an opportunity for him. So when JJ is running talent relations and handling contracts and things like that, and this one apparently slips by him, at least that's the way it's been framed. When Bruce tells the story on something to wrestle does an eager Jim Ross think Hey, there might be an opportunity here because the old man's not going to like that. And I kind of want to do a little more office stuff and you know, dig my roots in here a little more. D does that even cross your mind or do you not see it as an opportunity? Didn't see it as an opportunity whatsoever. Uh, and I, you know, I have a hard time kind of coming to grips that, uh, under with Bruce and Bruce is there and he's got the great defense that I was there. Jr. was on the inside. It was Pat and Vince and I, blah, 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 which is true. But I just never had a, uh, I didn't look at it as, oh, this would be a great opportunity for me. You know, uh, just didn't see it that way. And I also don't believe that, 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 that JJ was the only one that didn't know. If so, then that was a major, major error, but I don't, but JJ was always very meticulous and detail oriented and all the law, the information contract comes from the legal department, right? Hey, by the way, so and so's contracts up in 30 days or 60 days. I had all that when I was, when I was doing it, I had the whole roster, what everybody made the contract, start the contract end date, all that stuff. So I'm not just being argumentative regarding Bruce, uh, whatsoever. You know, I'm not sassafrasing his ass. Uh, <laughs> Whatever the fuck that means. Uh, uh, anyhow. Um, so no, I, I, I didn't look at it that way. <laughs> well, you know, we, JJ didn't get fired for that. No, Conrad. JJ quit by the way, not, yeah. not here a little later. JJ is going to wind up quitting. I didn't mean to say that JJ did a bad job or anything like that. I just know that you had had, um, challenging times so far in the WWF at this point. You know, you, you were brought in to do commentary and then they take you off and then you're doing some interview stuff. And I mean, you, you're back and forth a few times where it feels like you're trying to, you're not quite yet settled into this good old Jr. black hat persona that we know right. now. Correct. And, and now of course you're regarded as the goat, but back then it felt like Vince was not all the way sold on Jim. And I just know uh, enough of you to know that. You want to prove your worth. You want to prove your value. You want right. to load the damn wagon, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so I, in my head, it's like, Hey, you know what? If this slipped by, maybe there's an opportunity for me to help here. And, and I, I, I never, I, I see your point, but I didn't, I didn't feel that way. I didn't want uh, you to think I was trying to angle to say, Oh, take JJ's job. It's yeah. more a matter of maybe I could be of assistance here. Cause you I, 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 I had no idea JJ was going to leave. I see. Uh, and JJ left after everybody on the wrestling side took huge pay cuts and, you know, JJ had a family and he had a special needs child and young children, uh, and the stress got to him. He couldn't make a living based on the pay cut. And, uh, you know, we got Bruce and I were together in South Africa when that happened, it was the weekend of Shane McMahon's wedding. And, uh, and Bruce told me, cause he was on the phone with the office a lot. And, uh, you know, JJ quit. What? So yeah, JJ quit. 
And, and, and Bruce told me on the spot to his, to his credit, I want that job. Hmm. I said, how about it? So when we got back, Vince created another job. Bruce got JJ's job. Then I got the same. It's just a different title. So we had two of us doing basically the same thing. And, uh, you know, the, the idea was Bruce would handle more of the creative stuff <laughs> and I would handle, uh, business payroll contracts, things, you know, uh, working hand in glove with, uh, our staff on the, on the drug program, stuff like that. The shit job having to give somebody a notice. Right. And so, and then, uh, of course, then Bruce didn't like that. Uh, we know that story, you know, it, it just didn't work out for, for that, that my, my title was eliminated and, and I was given, then I got Bruce's job, which was JJ's job, which at one time was Patterson's job. And so that's kind of where that was, but, uh, you know, we all best took care of both of us, you know, that we could, we're going to get a chance to spread our wings and help build a, a rebuild our, our department cause the same old stuff, you know, there's nothing more important in WWF or any wrestling company than talent and television. And so, uh, we both bought into that concept and sure that's how that was, but no, I, I, uh, J JJ's, uh, departure was abrupt and surprising. Let's talk about, uh, the write up of all this Lex Luger jumping business from the observer quote, even more strange about this deal is that in mid August McMahon and Luger had a meeting where Luger informed McMahon about the potential WCW deal and McMahon gave him permission to negotiate without Titans permission to negotiate any WCW approaches to Luger would have been illegal contract tampering. And you have no idea how closely both groups watch their words and negotiations to avoid breaking the law and the ramifications because the penalties are so severe. Given the environment that the WWF WCW situation has turned into, it's hard to fathom why McMahon would have given Luger the permission to negotiate at that point in time. However, it is still said after the original negotiations fell through over a large difference in money, Luger informed McMahon negotiations fell through and he was put in a semi prominent position. He did the weird angle at SummerSlam and was a focal point of the superstars tapings. Two days later, plans for Luger were to have been working the next several months as the number six singles, babyface behind diesel, Sean undertaker, Brett and razor before a possible or probable heel turn in early 96. Let's just time out for right there. When you were running talent relations, I understand part of the, the, the game is we got to have good guys. We got to have bad guys. And you need top good guys and you need top bad guys. They got to be able to work against each other. Right. But when I read the number six singles, baby face behind, and then he lists guys, did you ever make a list like that in talent relations? No, uh, I mean, it was unwritten, Yeah. but I never made a list. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, the thing about booking a lot of events, Conrad, you went along with what the TV storylines were doing, right? It was easy to see what was being prioritized. So whoever was getting the most television time in the most productive way, uh, and, and had a marriage with some other talent on the roster. That's, that's what would be booked on the house shows. I, I didn't go like, uh, if Lex Luger had a program with Ludwig Borgo on television, that's what you're going to see at the house shows in some form. So, uh, I didn't go all cold because not you're booking cold matches in the house shows. And expecting to sell tickets. Why the hell would that happen? Right. So, uh, no, I never made a list like that. That was maybe I should have, I didn't, I didn't, that I ever recall. I also want to mention the, uh, the reason this, this war has heated up is again, nitro is coming up head to head with Monday night raw. And for years and years, the WWF has been so far ahead of WCW. They've lapped them twice. I mean, they're not real competition. But now when it feels like, well, damn, TNT is a big station and they're going live every week and they're head to head. It feels like, okay, maybe we do have some real competition here. Yeah. But Luger, even though he hadn't been the top guy is a valuable talent. Meltzer would continue. The claim is that after Luger and WCW reached their verbal deal on August 31st, Luger called McMahon up the next day, but never told him about any negotiations or informed him of anything. 
Luger continued to work the Canadian house shows through the Sunday night before he showed up on the nitro in Minneapolis. Luger never called McMahon after August 31st. And as of this past weekend, he still hadn't called. So he, I have a question for you on that. Yeah. So Melser apparently is either talking to Vince or Lex or Bruce or somebody, somebody, right? I mean, how would he know that? Right. He did a deep dive. <laughs> He unpacked his shit and there it was. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I was not involved. That was a Vince deal. And again, I wasn't in the position to affect it. Yay or nay. Uh, and I think that was a, and that's why I think Vince eventually sought people to reorganize that uh, talent relations department. So when he, when JJ quit it gave Vince the opportunity to, to fix what he perceived that needed to be updated and, uh, re, re, reevaluate our roster. And, and what are we getting our value for the people that we're paying, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where I came in along with Bruce, obviously, but that was kind of our goal to, to, to make the, we got to quit repurposing people. Got to get, we've got to stop repackaging people. That's not new. People want new, as I said, a zillion times, and we weren't giving them new. We're just giving them a repackage again, that coat of paint, teach them a new hold, yeah. get them some new boots, create a new finish, whatever, but it was still the same person. And, and at some point in time, you just got to tag out. So let's just run through the timeline. August 27th is SummerSlam 95, where he's involved in the main event. Uh, he's going to do TV tapings in Canton, Ohio on the 28th. And he's going to do TV tapings in Erie, Pennsylvania on August 29th. Those are both for superstars on the 30th. Uh, the, the, the company is touring through, uh, Niagara falls. He's in the main event, by the way, uh, tagging with Shawn Michaels to take on men on a mission. And the next day, the 31st, they're in Nova Scotia. And again, Luger's in the main event. On the uh, 31st, they did a double shot. There's a, a show in Ontario, another show in Ontario on the first, again, it's a double shot with uh, new Brunswick the same day on the first. And once again, Luger is in the main event. There's a show on uh, the second in Brantford, Ontario on the third, they're in St. John's, new Brunswick. And by the way, that's going to be Lex Luger's very last match. And once again, it's the main event. The main event is the intercontinental champion, Shawn Michaels teaming with Lex Luger to take on the tag champs, Owen and Yoko. And it's Luger's last match because he's going to leave new Brunswick and he's going to go to Minneapolis and make his debut on Monday nitro. So Sunday night, he's with you in the main event Monday night. He's on the other channel. It's a pretty impressive little coup for Eric Bischoff and company. Is it not? Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, and obviously we were unaware that Lex was looking at bolting Yeah, or he, the booking would have been different. He wouldn't even book that week. He certainly wouldn't have gone on last. Oh, so, uh, yeah, it was pretty, it was a pretty good, uh, get for Eric and the plan worked very well. It seems to me like, because again, when Luger walked out, uh, on nitro there in Minneapolis, it was a big deal, it was a big surprise. Like you, one of those, well, you know, if that had been now, it would have, it would have been trending that night, big time. You know, that's such a big deal anymore trending. So anyhow, yeah, it was a well-kept secret. It was a good get for Eric, a, a well, well laid out plan that they worked to perfection. When, when Lex leaves, I mean, obviously he's working in the main events, but did you see it as a loss? I know that that sounds really ugly and I don't mean for it to, but Bruce has sort of explained on something to wrestle that when he and Pat see the monitor and see Lex show up, supposedly Pat says he's their problem now or something. Yeah, I, I can see that. <laughs> uh, chat me up though. Did you, did you feel like, God damn, what could have been? He slipped through our fingers. We lost him. No, or was it? Okay. No, no. It, we tried everything Conrad. There, uh, there was, what more was there to do? The Lex airplane, the bus, the air, what's the next airplane? Uh, you know, I, I, there, we'd tried all these things 
and the company itself, uh, shot themselves in the foot at that summer slam in Chicago when Luger had a chance to be a made man and become the champion and see what it would have done to the business, to TV ratings, to live event ticket sales, et cetera, et cetera. But we blew it. And maybe we blew it in an educated way. Maybe we didn't really blow it. Maybe just uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, people change their minds. You know, Vince can be hot or cold sometimes. And, uh, I think that during that summer, as I pointed out earlier, I think it's when he finally said, eh, it's just not going to work. Right. And, and, and a lot of old promoters would be looking at their, uh, expense sheet saying how much I spent on promoting this guy, not Vince McMahon. He didn't, uh, he didn't, he didn't uh, live that way. He just moved on. And that's kind of what I think they decided to do with Lex until somewhere along that winter, you know, well, summer, uh, Royal Rumble's coming up. Let's, let's, uh, let's try this one more time. Right. Let's make sure now, cause you see how the guy looks, let's make sure now that, that we're not screwing this thing up. And, uh, and, and, and the, as it worked out, uh, Red Hart was the answer, not Lex Luger. Let's talk about, uh, Lex at the end of WCW, you know, it, it feels apparent that Jeff Jarrett was persona non grata when WCW goes down, um, Vince publicly fires him on TV, but we haven't really talked about Lex Luger. Uh, was there any interest in Lex? I mean, well, we know that buff gets a shot. Why didn't Lex get a shot with the company? Was he even discussed? I, I don't know if it was discussed very seriously because you know, the old leopard doesn't change its spots. He's, he's a high dollar, uh, guy. That's not a top guy. Okay. He'd been perceived as a top guy. Again, look at the cast of character. Look at the team he was on in WCW before WWE. Yeah. He had your father-in-law that made him a star. He did. And, uh, so, you know, credit to Nate's on that deal. As I said earlier, he didn't have his nature boy in, in WWE. He didn't have the, one of the most respected guys, in the entire bi- history of the business, uh, taking him by the hand and trying to lead into the promised land. So, uh, I think that we'd probably in a short answer would be the ship had sailed. We were done. So I, 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 I don't remember any, uh, I don't remember any serious discussions about bringing him back in for his second run, uh, after the, uh, Minneapolis nitro thing, not at all. Chat me up. Do you remember talking to Lex after he leaves the WWF? I mean, obviously you did. I know you did a podcast with him years later, but when is the next time you and Lex have a conversation? Might've been then not much. I wasn't real close with him. I didn't dislike him. Uh, I, uh, his attitude sometimes was a little bit stressful because he's, he didn't have a big keen sense of urgency. Sometimes, uh, I remember one time we ran, uh, where was it? We ran, uh, event in Nassau Coliseum. I think is in the New York area. I think it was Nassau. It might've been East Rutherford, New Jersey. I'm not sure, but some, one of those two markets. And he was up, I was there helping produce a show and it was his, you know, he was next and it was a high level match and he was just taking his time music's playing. And, uh, I remember saying something, you know, come on, Les, God damn, they're waiting on you. You know, it's like, take it easy, Jr. Just take it easy. So, okay. Have at it then, you know, you know, you knew when you're coming on, I, I, you know, you don't go, there's no reason to start a discussion, right? What is there to, to discuss? It's just, it wasn't good. So we didn't have a close about the only, the closest person to Lex was staying in the, in the, in WCW all those years. I'm sure other guys that said, oh, he's a friend of mine. You know, we'd talk casually or, or I go to their gym and work out or whatever. But uh, a lot of guys said he didn't, he wasn't outgoing. So, uh, to me or anybody else in that respect. So I don't think I, I don't remember talking to him. What are you going to say? Right. I, uh, you can say good luck, you know, hope you do great. The, the obligatory 
stuff. But, you know, was it really meaningful? I don't know. It just seems to be a lip service to me. But, uh, no, I, I don't, I don't, I didn't have a, the relationship with him, Conrad, that would have prompted me to, uh, to seek him out on that. And, and in hindsight, I wish I had him probably been a smart move for me just in the end, more important, the right thing to do. Right. But it just, it just wasn't that way. You know, there's no way for us to, uh, to talk about the Lex Luger story and not address one thing that I think he's sort of been handled unfairly with. I'm talking about Miss Elizabeth, a lot of fans, uh, and we even got a lot of questions about it and we're not going to go through them all, but a lot of fans sort of point the finger at Lex and say, oh, well, Miss Elizabeth, I don't think that's fair to Lex. You know, uh, there's sadly been, uh, there's been a lot of people who we fell in love with as wrestling fans in the wrestling profession who lost their life way too early Mm. due to a lethal combination of drugs and alcohol. And I don't know that it's necessarily fair that wrestling fans sort of point the, uh, the ugly stick at Lex Luger in that regard for her. Uh, Yeah. It's personal accountability. You know, for instance, Bam Bam Bigelow, he passed away in 07. Uh, and it was an accidental overdose type situation, just like Miss Elizabeth. But I think wrestling fans have convinced themselves that the real life Miss Elizabeth was this, um, you know, I don't know, home, pristine snow white type character that we saw her with, with the macho man back in the eighties, but the real life that that's not her real life in real life. She did drugs and alcohol. She did too much one day and she lost her life, but that's not, it's not like Luger's holding her down and making her do no. you, you get what I'm saying here. Yeah. He was made out to be the heel. It's not, she fair. was too pristine. She was too much of a, you know, the girl next door, our TV character, uh, that, that, uh, WWF developed was along with Savage, uh, was, uh, you know, a TV character. Yes. And, uh, you know, I, I can't speak to that real well because I just never had any relationship with her at all. Well, but the point is Jim, even if, and I'm just, let's pretend for a minute, even if we're going with the idea that, oh, well, he was a bad influence on her. Yeah. Where does the personal accountability come in? Like, yeah, she was an adult. Yes. She was an adult, uh, free to make her own decisions and the decision I say when she died of the, I'm, I'm I'll admit I was guilty too, because my preconceived notion of miss Elizabeth was that of a, essentially a Southern bell. Yes. And, uh, that didn't have any negative baggage. Right. So when I heard that she died of, of a, a drug overdose, I too said, well, that must've been uh, dr- that, that train must've been, been driven by Lex. So he changed, he, he changed, uh, from the Lex express to something else here. He's driving, but let's not, like you said, he, he can't be blamed for her habits. No. And, uh, some people have already listened to this are going to disagree with that. And that's your prerogative folks. I'm not going to hunt you well, down. Well, well, I mean, at the same time, if that's true, then <laughs> you know, what's the, is the difference that there's a romantic relationship? Because I mean, can we blame Lex Luger for Bam Bam Bigelow's untimely death or big boss man's or Rick Rude's or Kurt Hennings? No. I mean, at the end of the day, these are grown. Elizabeth was 42 years old and she made poor choices that caught up with her and cost her life. And it's sad. It doesn't necessarily mean we should all blame Lex Luger. And I feel like he's been villainized for a long, long time on that deal. I and, agree. I can, and I can only imagine from his perspective, no matter the circumstance, when you lose someone who is that big of a part of your life and it happens right in front of you, that's gotta be God awful tragic. Yeah, it is. And it's not fair. Yeah. Not fair to have to live with that more days than not. So yeah, I don't that's a good point. You bring up a very good point, Conrad, you know, she's got to be miss Elizabeth has to be held accountable. For her own actions. If, uh, 
she was being manipulated to doing excessive amounts of, uh, of life threatening drugs and alcohol at the behest of her beloved Lex might have a different story there, but we don't but I, that F fans just created that narrative. You know what oh, I, mean? I agree. I agree with you. So bottom line is that she has to be accountable for her own actions and people should stop blaming Lex Luger for miss Elizabeth's death. Yes. And when they do that, they'll probably feel a little bit better about themselves, but no, there's no way in hell that I, but I did, I, I was one of those people though. Uh, I think, oh, Lex, I heard Lex is partying real heavy and all this good stuff. Uh, and so that's gotta be a tie in there somehow, some way. So then instead of not, not really vilifying, but instead of putting the blame where it needs to be, it, it was a lot easier just to blame Lex. Cause again, he had not embraced himself to a lot of people. And that's why one of the reasons he had his issues in wrestling was that he didn't get over. It was cause he didn't connect to the audience. Let my family save your family some cash. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket, but we will save you money. It's not a matter if it's a matter of how much save with Conrad.com. He Lex Luger was not a beloved character. Miss Elizabeth was a beloved character. So you go to the bad guy and the bad guy in this scenario, in the eyes of many folks was the male of the of Lex. So I don't know. I, but the, in, in the bottom line, putting a bow on this deal, he, she should not be, he should not be blamed and be the sole cause of her issues. It's just not fair. And more importantly, it's just not accurate. Well, the, the story here is, uh, drugs and alcohol in excess, like anything else in excess is, is not going to end well. Right. Uh, he wound up getting a DUI in April of 03. And then in may is when, uh, miss Elizabeth left us. And when the police are there, they find all kinds of stuff, anabolic steroids, oxycodone, et cetera. And it even makes the confidential program that the WWE was putting together at the time. It's like a headline story. They're looking for dirt and boy, they had it, but you know, playing the nine one, one call and, and all of that, I, I just felt like was in poor taste Yeah, and, and it almost felt vindictive, uh, you know, for, Hey, this is our receipt. Now I know you're going to say, no, nah, that's not true. And I understand that, but still the guy leaves, maybe not on the best of terms. He doesn't come back. Here's a story where somebody who's not under our employee had something tragic happen. Well, let's just, let's exploit it in hindsight. Right. I wish the company wouldn't have played the nine one, one call. Can we agree on that? Yeah, but they're going to go back to this. It's, it's a news item and just, we're just reporting the news. But you're not a news company. You're a fucking wrestling company. I I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm not, I'm not defending them in that respect whatsoever. Uh, and they took some liberties, no doubt about it. And I'm sure there was some vindictiveness, uh, involved in this. I mean, the embarrassment of, of walking out of a, of WWF and then showing up on your rivals television show, unannounced unknown to you, uh, was hard for some folks in WWF to get over. And I'm sure included at the top of the list was Mr. McMahon. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about Lex's legacy, but before we do, I want to ask, cause this is the question everybody wants to know. Why do you think Lex Luger's not in the WWE hall of fame? Some of those things we just talked about the embarrassment he, he thrown on the company. Uh, I believe he will be, I believe so too. I believe that Lex Luger will be in the WWE hall of fame. Uh, uh I think it'll be a popular decision when it occurs. Cause he, he'll be allowed in his two or three minutes. He's allocated, which we've talked about before is ridiculous. Don't, don't, uh, induct so damn many people have a manageable number of people and, and, and so that they have the appropriate time using common sense and logic to tell their story. Uh, he's got a hell of a story to tell. He's got a hell of a story to tell. So I believe that Lex will be 
in the WWE Hall of Fame at some point in time. That's just my take on it. <clears throat> I don't have any insider knowledge and all that good shit. Uh, I haven't talked to Dave or anybody else about it. It's just a matter of, I think cooler heads will prevail at some point in time and he'll be, he'll be inducted. But I think it's the, the, the burning of the bridges, uh, how he conducted himself on his exit, things like that to contributed to, to him. But if you want a story, Conrad, if they want to tell stories and they want a visual cause Lex obviously thank God still alive. Here's a guy that wrote, will be rolled onto the stage to tell a story. He's in a wheelchair. So if you're looking for a story, this could be a great story. Tremendous. And a story of success because Lex found true happiness in his faith. And many heathens, uh, don't give a shit about faith, uh, to any degree. Uh, so I, I think that he'll be in and, and, uh, and I think it'll be a, a, a I think it'll be a great induction. I, 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 I truly believe that. I think it will be great. So we'll see, we'll see. But I think that the, some old wounds just don't heal as quickly as others. And when you embarrass the company to some degree, and I look, here's the thing. Let's put the warrior in. Yep. So I don't know that Lex did anything any more egregious by a long shot than the warrior did to WWF WWE. Yeah. And they still that warrior award. They do. So, and, and we're debating, not debating, you and I are discussing Luger going to the hall of fame. Seems like a no brainer. It is a no brainer. I'm with you on that. And I hope that it doesn't happen posthumously. Uh, Me too. It, it won't, it won't Conrad. I don't think. I think it's, I think Vince is smart enough to know that he doesn't like posthumous inductions. And I think that, uh, I don't think he likes wheelchairs on the stage either. He might not, man. He might not, but it's a story. It's a real story. Yeah. That was that he didn't write. Right. And so I don't know. I, I, but deserving a tenure, you know, uh, I, I just think there's a lot of reasons that you would do it, but, uh, but we'll see. We'll see. Let's, let's say this though. We, we've talked about a little bit of negativity in a dark place in Luger's life, but I, I, I want to hit the reset his, his book wrestling with the devil and his appearances. You got to go out of your way to, to see and meet this person. He's a yeah. special human being. He's turned his life around. He's pulled the nose up. Uh, I, I realize that he has some physical challenges, but this is still very much a success story. You know, the goal in life for everyone listening to this is to be happy. Yeah. Lex no Luger is happy in 2021 and we are happy for him. And I'm happy that this story has a happy ending. Certainly there are trials and tribulations along the way, but Lex Luger is a testament to the human spirit of, of perseverance and, and positivity and the power of those things. And I'm just, I'm glad that he's with us and, and I hope that he gets his moment on stage real soon. And. Yeah, I want to ask you, Jim, you know, in terms of his legacy in wrestling, what, what do you think that will ultimately wind up being? Will it be the WCW run the first time? Will it be beating Hogan on nitro for the world title? Uh, will it be, you know, the Lex express? What do you think he'll be most remembered for? Interesting question. <laughs> and, and, there, and there's a lot of right answers probably on it. I, I equate it to, I don't know if you remember a uh, football player that went to Oklahoma named Marcus Dupree. I do from uh, Philadelphia, Mississippi, uh, arguably the greatest high school running back in history. Uh, he went to OU and, uh, got the wrong people and got influenced to transfer and, and all this other shit. So he went, so he transferred, but they did a 30 for 30 on, on Marcus. And it was called something along the lines of the greatest story never told or the something along those lines. And I kind of think that's what we are here with Luger in my view. It was probably never was. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. The best that never was. I, I kind of get that feel with, uh, Lex, uh, had everything look size, demeanor, 
athletic ability, all these things, but it never happened. And we, on our first show we did on this. And so if somebody's watching today and hasn't watched part one, there's a lot of errors in booking with Luger. Yeah. And you, you get him right to the altar and then the, the wedding's off more than once. He got left standing at the altar many, many times. I think that affected fans confidence in him. And, uh, I think some fans are smart enough to know that if he was, they didn't go all the way with him for some tenure or something believable and realistic, there's something wrong here. And, uh, so I think that's where I would say his legacy is the greatest that never was. Well, and we hope this was a good experience for you. I, uh, I love talking about Lex Luger. Uh, I think he's one of the great stories in professional wrestling, and I'm glad we got to do his story justice, or at least I hope we did. Uh, we're going to be back next week with another great episode of grill and JR, and, uh, we're going to tell you all about it. But first I think it's time we talk about grilling season because it is upon us. Of course, we did this show sort of, uh, right before 4th of July to, uh, get you in the mood for the Lex express. But around these parts, Jim, the 4th of July is all about grilling. Yeah. Whenever I'm firing up the grill, I immediately come inside, open my cabinet. It, it might as well just have a black hat on the damn cabinet. It's all your product. <laughs> Thank you. ARSBBQ.com. Well, I appreciate that, Conrad. Uh, it is a grilling season, like you said, for many of us with our history, our heritage, how we were raised, what our moms and dads enjoyed doing with us. You know, that was a way of entertaining people in the South. Uh, it was, it was, inex you got to eat. Yeah. You know, a brother's got to eat Conrad. You and I've both heard that plenty of times. I use that as an excuse. Hey, a brother's got to eat. Uh, and so I'm, I'm a big believer that there's a lot of benefit to grilling with family and friends and buddies and neighbors and all those type things. Uh, and so we've tried to accommodate everybody as best we can with our customer service, which I take great pride in. And it's jrsbbq.com is where you can go to look. Don't cost nothing to look. Two barbecue sauces, chipotle ketchup. My favorite probably is the jalapeno honey mustard. Uh, it changes the complexion and the personality of any sandwich. Uh, I use the, uh, the uh, mustard on my salmon. I'm a big salmon guy. So I'm a, I'm a drizzle or two of uh, the mustard on the salmon. It's amazing. And as we said, I think I mentioned this last week, we've been out of, uh, our seasoning. And so I have given the previous seasoning manufacturer, their notice, they're no longer being booked. Uh, and so consequently we've got new seasoning. It's, it's been approved. It's, I, I've tasted it. I got a couple of bottles to cook with use on uh, cooking here at home. Uh, and I'm going to, I can't wait to get back to Oklahoma where I have my grill, my outdoor kitchen. That's the one downer here in, uh, in uh, Jacksonville beach is I can't have a grill, uh, on my patio. So I create ways to cook with my seasoning and all the stuff without having to do it on a grill. So I'm using, I'm learning to use the broiler. I'm learning to bake better and, and, uh, and, and the stove top stuff. So it's all good. And again, I always credit my mom and my, and, and, and uh, my little Italian Jan and, uh, for helping create these products. And I know that they both be proud of the fact that we're, we're, we're doing the business the right way and we're, uh, hopefully, uh, making folks happy with what we're, what we're doing. So prices are fair. Customer service is great. Uh, and I just hope people give it a shot great for it's great for gifts, all these things, you know, we, uh, I think we sold seven. I think I told you this before somewhere in seven or 8,000 bottles of saw of, uh, seasoning it's a lot. last year. Yeah. And it, it overwhelmed the manufacturer. So I got a manufacturer now that we've tweaked the recipe. It's better, a lot better. And before it was damn good. Sure. It's a lot, lot better. And, uh, they're in Wichita, Kansas. So we can actually get our stuff made and go pick it up from Norman right up I 35. So we're getting it together. It's coming along, but I appreciate you talking about it and mentioning it and using it. And, uh, again, folks, I always say this, 
it costs not a damn thing to look. Yeah. So why not? Why not look? And by the way, uh, I'm excited. You know, we're, we're about in AEW world. We're about ready to start back on the road. Uh, starting with Miami here in a few days and there's still tickets available. AEW ticks. If you're looking at where, where are you going to be? Are there tickets available? You know, what's available? Uh, all those things. AEW ticks, T I X.com has your, has all those answers. And we're going to kick it off our, our getting back on the road. Uh, I love those commercials that uses the uh, cheers thing, you know, welcome back. And I, I'm kind of excited about going back on the road. I'm not so excited about TSA or some of those things, but, uh, I, I'm really excited about getting back in front of the crowd. So I think it's going to, I think it's going to make all of our work better and, uh, it should be fun. So, uh, keep us in mind on that deal. We're going to be and the ticket advances are good. Charlotte's good. Houston's good. Uh, Austin's almost sold out. Dallas is really good. So it's, uh, it's going to be fun to get back out there and see the signs and see the fans and listen. And they're so motivational. So it's, it's some cool shit. So anyway, life is pretty good in my, my world, Conrad. I'm very blessed. And or I don't, des have you. Or don't deserve it, but I'm very blessed. Well, we don't deserve you. We're excited to have you and visit with you every Thursday here on grill and Jr. We'll be back next week talking about another big moment in Lex Luger's career. Great American bash 91. A lot to unpack here, as a friend of mine likes to say. Uh, Rick Flair's walking out of the company. He's on the poster. He's supposed to be challenging or defending his title against Lex Luger, but it's not going to happen. Instead, it winds up with Luger and Barry Windham in a steel cage match for the world title, but they don't even have the world title. It's a mess. It's <laughs> WCW at 91. We're going to be back next week talking about it and uh, tell a friend. To hit the subscribe button and tell them uh, about your favorite new podcast, Grill and JR with the yeah. wrestling, Mr. Jim. Baby Ross. needs new shoes, baby. And brothers got to eat. And we're going to do brothers some of the Got to. Brothers got to eat. And we're going to do some of that next week, right here on Grill and JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Thank you, Conrad. And today, your cheeks were especially prolific. Thank my you. boy. <laughs> Have a good week, everybody. Take care. Have some fun. Laugh every now and then. I'm trying to laugh, but whatever. Thanks, Connie. See you guys. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30 year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money, it's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.